Hello, and welcome to Fierce Conversations with Toby, the show where we talk about the hard things. I'm Toby Dorr. In today's episode, we'll explore the world of music and life choices. Our guest today is Lisa Plass, a musician who composed, arranged, and played the flute in the theme song for this podcast. Hi, Lisa. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Toby. Thanks for having me. I'm just delighted to have you here. Um, music is something that is not a very big part of my life, and I'd like it to be more a part of my life. So I'm really excited to learn more about music. Uh, but first, let's start off with what's your favorite color and what does that color say about you? Um, it's always been pink. Um, mm -hmm. I find it to be very playful. I love all shades of pink. It doesn't matter from the light to the bold. I find it nostalgic. It just really takes me back to my childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, it just reminds me of my bedroom and, you know, just the way my mother had decorated it in white and pink. And it just takes me back and it gives me comfort. So I love that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's my favorite weird. color too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I tend to wear dark colors because I'm a musician. So I'm always dressed in black or dark mm -hmm. blue, but my go-to is pink. Definitely. I love that. I love that. So can you tell us about a crossroads in your life that pushed you in a different direction? Sure. Um, it was actually when I was little. I was uh, I had just turned eight years old and um, I was meeting my friend at the playground, uh, the school playground, just to play on the swing set. And when I got to the school, I heard some music and it really intrigued me because, you know, back when you're little, you think summer, no, nobody's at school. Why would there be any sound? Right. So I, uh, of course, was curious right away and I, you know, peeked in and it, the visions, I still have it as clear as the day that it happened. It felt like almost like a horror story because you're walking down <laughs> a corridor and you're not sure what's happening. But then I started peeking into the classrooms and I saw these kids that were playing instruments and um, I just kept looking in one classroom after the other. And then finally I saw what I didn't realize was a flute at the time, but I saw this long, thin silver instrument and it sounded so pretty and i quickly ran to find an adult to find this what's going on and why aren't i part of this <laughs> um, so the band director uh said here's a packet take it home to your parents i ran out of the school told my friend i gotta go i have stuff to do and i ran <laughs> home gave the packet to my mom you know my mom said we'll have to talk to your father and um, she said, because, you know, this is very expensive. And, you know, back in the 70s, she told me $200 and you might as well set a million dollars to me because that just mm -hmm. seemed like a lot. Right. Of yeah. And um, so I thought, oh, there's no way they're going to go for this. And my father came home. They were looking everything over. And then he turned to me and he said, well, it just doesn't make sense to rent it. And I was so for that instant, I thought my whole world came crashing down. He said, we're going to have to buy it. And I was like, what? And he <laughs> said, yeah, it just makes more sense to buy it. And I said, really? And then he filled out the paperwork. And a week later, I got the flute and I've never looked back. So, wow. you know, yeah. that, that's been, you know, a major crossroad in my life of deciding <laughs> what I wanted to do. <laughs> and so you took that flute and you went to your room and you played and tried and played and tried. And I think one time you told me you didn't make a sound come out of it for six months, but you didn't yeah. give up. It didn't. I tried everything. And um, I, there were times that I thought, oh, my God, I'm wasting my dad's money. I can't even do anything with this. Mm -hmm. But I kept going at it. And the best thing of it all is that my band director um, said to me, you know what? I see the determination. You can't give up. You mm -hmm. will get a sound. He said, for whatever reason, you're going to get that sound. It's just taking a little bit more time. And within a month or so after that, I finally started getting the sounds. And once that started, I just never stopped. There was and, no stopping you. Yeah. No, but it was a great life lesson because it, it really taught me at an early age how not to give up and not mm -hmm. to walk away from something that's challenging. But also the kindness and understanding of my band director, which showed me that patience and understanding. So now as a teacher, I have that same uh, feeling and same effect on my students by saying, you can do anything. If you mm -hmm. try, no matter what, just you have to get past the hump and do it. And I think that's what's really made it beneficial for me when I work and, with people. And you have your own music studio today. So yes. tell us a little bit about what your life looks like. 
So I opened my music studio back in uh, September of 98. So we're actually coming up on our 25th anniversary. Wow. I, I can't even believe. Um, I started out as a band director um, and I was teaching, but it was extremely time consuming. And then having young children, I knew that I needed to make a change and have a more flexible schedule. So I opened up my music studio and we teach instrumental and vocal lesson. Um, I do a lot of projects with the studio in terms of going out as a music director for different shows. I, I'm hired as a musician to perform at different events. So it allowed me that flexibility so that I could still do what I love. I could still make a living at it and I could still be accessible for my kids, which was the most important thing for me is being yeah. there as a mom. That was a great solution. Mm -hmm. um, I know I discovered myself through journaling in prison and I know that you journal daily too. So how important is that practice for you? I It's really important. It really is. I mean, it's basically my form of therapy. Um, I get to put down all my feelings. I don't have to say them out loud because then I can look back and think it through, especially if I have an issue that I'm trying to work out mm -hmm. um, or any conflicts that are happening with other people. I just have to really put it down on paper and it just helps me process. Plus, it's it's a great record of my life because, yeah. you know, life gets chaotic. Sometimes you blink and 10 years went by and you sometimes forget those little details. So it's nice to go back, open up a day. And just remember what I did that day. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been much more vigilant since the pandemic because I used to write on a regular basis, but not every day. And then mm -hmm. once the pandemic started, I write every single day now just you to know, record my life. Yeah, I found that when I hand write something, I feel like it connects to my heart. And mm -hmm. when I sit at the computer and type, it more comes from my head. So mm -hmm. I just really think there's power in the written word. It, I, I, I hope we don't ever get away from it. Yeah. I mean, I have to write it down by hand first for it to be real. Yeah. So, um, a lot of the process of anything that I do writing wise, I always handwrite it. And then I go to the computer because you're really right with that. When you type at the computer, it is just coming from your head. Mm -hmm. There's really no emotion. I feel almost detached from it. But yes. With that pen in my hand, I have all these emotions. You become a part of it. Yeah. When you're yeah. typing, it's like you're watching it come, you know, right. you're not feeling it come. You're not birthing yeah. it. Exactly. So, yeah. There is a big yeah. difference there. Mm -hmm. So yes. I had you, uh, I mentioned to you last fall that I was going to do a podcast and asked if you might do a theme song for my podcast and you were happy to do it. And I just love the theme song and everybody I've played it to is just in love with it. So tell me how that kind of came together in your head. Oh, sure. This is, I mean, this was um, something that took a while because I had a couple different ideas in my head, you know, based on getting to know you as a person and the things that you liked and some of the things you were talking about. So as you were discussing what your podcast was going to be like and how it was morphing and changing, I was doing the same thing with the creative process for the music. First, I started out with something that was more ethereal and, you know, fantasy like. And then I thought, you know what? No, that's not the message that I want to give her, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I was thinking something more orchestral, more strong, like a symphony of some type nature, you know, to give mm -hmm. you. And I said, you know what? That doesn't even fit. And then one day I was just driving to the studio and this little bass line just hopped into my head and I said, oh my God, I literally pulled over and had to hum it into my phone so I didn't forget. Oh, wow. Um, you know, and then I got to the studio and I was like, all right, let me write this bass line down. And then I then I went to the piano and started thinking of the piano line. So the idea being is that the bass line is that introduction saying, hey, I'm Toby and I'm here to talk to you. Uh -huh. the piano comes in and says, yeah, what can I do to help you? and make this a smooth transition. And then I put the flute line in to mix it up and shake it up and say, no, 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 we're going to get fierce now. And <laughs> the idea of the flute coming in and just shaking it all up so that it's not this calm, melancholy thing. We're going to shake it up. We're going to have the fierce conversations. We're going to get down to business and we're going to get our message across. So that's how it all, you know, evolved. And, and it just, and once it came, it just, within three days, I had everything completely done. Mm -hmm. You know, so sometimes that's how long it took me a few months because I was working on a couple different shows. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I always had it in the back of my mind and I, I had 
dozens of little jingles that I had written down in my book. But that one, when it came, I was like, this is it. This is the one. Yeah, I love it. And I love knowing the story behind it, too, because now when I listen to it, I think, oh, yeah, here we go. We're starting out. It's all nice and calm. And now we're going to shake it up. And mm-hmm. I just love it. it I, ju- I just am so thrilled to death that you were able to write that for me. Oh, well, I am so glad that I could do that for you. And I'm so glad that you love it because. Yeah, it's, it is, it's just uh, perfect. It thanks. is just perfect. Thanks. So you create musical programs, direct symphonies, play in concerts, teach music and voice, but what part of music fills your soul the most? You know, I I thought about that for a while, you know, because I do, there is a sense of um, fulfillment when I get up and perform, you know, myself, because I do know that I'm affecting the audience. And and to this day, I do have people that come back to me and say, oh my God, I saw you. And I don't even remember it because I've done, I do so many performances over the year. But knowing that I touch them and that they still think about that, you know, that really means something to me and I, and knowing that I did that for them and they were like, I was in such a bad mood, but I came to this concert and you made my day, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so knowing that I have that impact is really nice. But I think what gives me even more joy is when I'm directing something and I'm working with students or I'm working with an organization and with these, uh, you know, amateur musicians and nurturing them and guiding them and then seeing it come together and then seeing the look on their eyes when they're like, oh, I did it, you know, mm-hmm. that's, I think what gives me the biggest sense of accomplishment because I was able to pass my passion of music onto this person and have them create music that in turn moved an audience. So it's me passing it along because it's so much more than just me getting on stage and affecting an audience member, I actually gave somebody the tools to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. So that can you just spread that positivity through music? Yeah, I love that. And I imagine the first time you went out on a big stage to play the flute, that you were nervous. Oh, Is, well, I'm always nervous. You're always nervous. Always. That was going to yeah. be my question. Has yeah. that gone away? No, the day it goes away is the day you need to stop. Ah. Because, yeah, you. the nerves are what does it the nerves are what creates that energy um Um, we all get it you know all of my friends we're all professional musicians and we all look at each other i mean we do it like you would breathe mm -hmm. you know if i could be having a cup of coffee talking to somebody they're like lisa you're on okay put my coffee down and i go but the minute i walk out on stage all of a sudden i get the butterfly and i'm like oh "Oh, grew up and you know that is so interesting i love that i love that the minute you're not nervous is when you need to quit i love that yeah, I, that's so true for so many things. Yeah, you have to. That, that shows that you're connected because if you mm-hmm. if you start not feeling, then that's not going to work well as a musician. Wow, I love that. I love that. You told us how you came across that classroom with the flute, and you like the little airy sound of it. But what is it that just ties your soul to the flute? I think it's the overall sound. It's like a sound of freedom. Mm-hmm. Um, because when they use the flute in terms of any orchestral or even in, you know, Broadway, you know, pop, it's always like this little flitting thing. I always picture like a butterfly uh-huh. or, or it just represents to me the lightness and the freedom and the flexibility that life gives you. So uh-huh. I think that's what it is that I love so much about it because it, it has that. It just reminds me of that. I love that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I do love that. And you can pick the flute out in a group of music. You, the flute stands alone. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I love that. So you told me once that music is the way you think. So let's mm-hmm. play a little game. What song would you choose to play at an outdoor picnic? Oh, that's easy. Any Latin song ever written. Because <laughs> they, the, the Latin and me, because my mom is from Puerto Rico. Mm-hmm. You know, we'll put on things like from Gypsy King, J Lo, Pitbull, Gloria Stefan. You know, it's just any of that, and we just start dancing and singing along, and that's you know what being outdoors. Is. That's mm-hmm. that, that's know, what being outdoors is all yeah, about. It's moving a playlist that I associate with different things, and it's in my Latin mix. That's the I'm outside, and this is what we're playing. Mm-hmm. I love that. So, what song would you play at a family gathering? We always. I mean, this is like. 
clockwork. Anytime the entire family gets together, we play celebration for, uh, from Cool and the Gang. Uh huh. So it's just, uh, it's just one of those things. No matter what, whatever get together it is, somehow we have to play that song. That's so. pretty cool. I kind of like your family has a theme song. Maybe yeah. every family should have a theme song. I think that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, I love yeah. it. I'm gonna have to think about what my. Well, I have a theme song now, uh-huh. thanks to you. But you yeah. know what my family theme song is? I'm gonna be thinking about that. Yeah, yeah. So, what song brings tears to your eyes every time you hear it? Oh, uh, there, there's a lot because um, when you look at classical music in any shape or form, depending on the piece, the layers of it just go through you, especially if you're in a lot of concert. And um, some of them just literally, you, I can feel it. Like my heart starts racing. I start breathing like, ah, because I'm so excited about the music. And even when I'm playing, it's hard because I have to contain myself and mm-hmm. remember not to get so excited and focus on the music. But things like Adagio for Strings by Samuel Barber is one of the most beautiful pieces that I think I've ever heard. And it's just so beautifully written. Um, Appalachian Springs by Aaron Copeland. It's just this walking out in the fields. You know, it's like being at one with nature. Mm-hmm. And- it's just the the chord structures. It gives me chills. Like the minute it starts, I get the goosebumps, and I'm just from head to toe and just overwhelmed by the song. By the time it builds and builds, I I'm tearing up because it's just that's how much emotion it brings out in me. And um, you know, then there's things like the William Tell Overture or mm-hmm. uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony when it comes with the full orchestra and chorus. I can't help him. I'm, I'm literally crying. I'm my eyes. Ju- I just wow. can't help it, you know, and it's not that I'm in a bad mood or anything. That's mm-hmm. the way the, the music moves me. And, you know, you that's know, action. you're going to have to send me links to those songs. Cause I want to listen to them now. And, and I want to share with you a short little story. I grew up in Kansas city, which is, you know, a medium sized city. And we had a Kansas city symphony. And when I was a kid every year, All through grade school, they'd load us on a bus and we'd go to the Kansas City Symphony and we'd watch the symphony. Mm -hmm. Uh, And at the time, you know, I didn't appreciate it. I didn't get it. But, you know, we went every year. And my husband grew up in down East Main on a blueberry farm. And there's no symphony anywhere around. Well, Mm -hmm. we were living in Sedalia, Missouri, which is a little town in the middle of Missouri. And they have a symphony in Sedalia. It's the oldest symphony in Missouri. And... They asked me to do a website for them. And in return, they gave me season tickets. So I told Chris, you know, oh, we got somewhere to go tonight. You know, and he said, okay, we get in the car and go. And he's like, he doesn't know where we're going. And when we get there and we walk in, he said, what is this? And I said, well, it's the symphony. And he said, oh, and we sat down and they started playing. And Chris turned to me and there were tears running down his face. And he said, how have I never heard this before? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And still to this day, you know, this year for Christmas, we live in the D.C. area now. And his son gave him tickets to the Washington Symphony, the National Symphony. And we went for his birthday. And Chris just still, every time we go to a symphony, he cries because the music just yeah. reaches him. So yeah. that I think that's beautiful. It is. It's very it's very powerful. And um, and it really makes me feel good when I'm able to give that experience to someone as well. Mm-hmm you know, by sharing them, sharing something with them. And, you know, just a short little story of Rent, which was a musical on Broadway. I um, saw it many times, but I saw it when it opened and I saw it on the day that it closed. Oh, well, the day that it opened, I went with my husband. We had just uh, started dating at the time. I don't think we were married yet, but we went and saw it and it moved me to a level I didn't even realize possible. And then flash forward 20 years later, I went with my uh, girlfriend and we took her daughter. Oh. We got to one of the moments of this show where it is just gut wrenching. And she grabbed my arm and was crying hysterically. And I said, I did it. I gave this experience, <laughs> you know, because I was hoping I didn't want to uh-huh. say I didn't you want didn't to want her. to spoil the moment, right? No, I didn't want to spoil it, but I was like, it's coming, it's coming. I wonder if she's going to react. And when she grabbed my arm and looked at me and the tears were coming down, I was like, she gets it. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, so 
it, it's the, it's things like that that I mean that's what gives me pure joy is knowing that that's somebody, beautiful. Let somebody feel that yeah. yeah. So, what's your very favorite song to play? Um, it's actually a song that I wrote when I was in college. I wrote it in my senior year. It was for my uh, senior recital. And it was a dedication to my father because he had taken us. He was born in Bangladesh, which actually was East Pakistan at the time and then became Bangladesh. Um, he had taken us for a once in a lifetime trip to see where he had born, was born, where he had went to school, you know, basically took us on a, you know, memory lane mm -hmm. um, tour. And I met. Uh, a lot of his family that had never come to America, but I had seen my uncles who had come to America, but they were back there. Mm -hmm. And one of his brothers used to hum constantly just, and I picked that up the minute I mm -hmm. saw him, I was like, oh, he's humming. And I just kept following him around. Like, you know, so if you had like, if there was back then, if there was technology, people would have been videoing me, watching, running after him. Like I was uh -huh. just, because you know, <laughs> he was humming. And so I was like writing down little things. And so as a tribute, I surprised my dad and I put together this piece and I called it Homeland and oh. didn't tell him. And, you know, and my father, you know, was, you know, just very, you know, very stiff, never, never showed emotion. Very stoical. Very, yes. And mm -hmm. he was just, you know, nothing really could shake him. I shook him. He was crying. He came to your senior recital and he heard he you play this seat. song that was dedicated yeah, to him. Because uh, he didn't come very often because mm -hmm. you know, he was working or whatever. So, and not that it mattered, but but I said to him, you have to come to my senior recital, you know, and I made sure that it was at a time that I knew he could come, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and I, I did. He cried. So I was like, I mean, that's one of the maybe twice in my entire life that I ever saw him tear up for anything. I love that. I and love I that. Never, yeah, so, oh, I love that. Yeah. So, were you going to play that for us? Um, I could play a little bit for you if okay. you'd like. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd like, like to hear it. I, I think our I'll listeners just... would too. All right, I'll give you a little bit of the opening. Okay. So it ha it's a solo flute, and I did that on purpose because, again, I just love the sound of the flute. I love mm -hmm. just you know having it by itself, and um, and it's called Homeland, and these are all little snippets of what my uncle was humming as he was walking the race fields in wow in, wow yeah. so here's a little bit of it okay So that's the intro. <laughs> I love that. It just amazes me that you could just pick up an instrument and play something without having to look at the music. You know, I got to uh, write things down and look at them. And so I think that's just wonderful. I love that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So I gave my granddaughter a guitar for Christmas and she was so excited about it. You know, for a week and a half, she wore it everywhere she went and she would just strum it, you know, and, and I took her to a guitar lesson at a music studio and she loved it. And the guy at the music studio said, I think you've got something here. She's going to catch on really quick. Well, mm -hmm. then, you know, there was the cost of those expensive lessons at the studio. And her parents found a guitar lesson online with about 20 other kids. And and she, it was boring. And, and now, you know, she doesn't want to play at all. So mm -hmm. what is the best way to introduce an instrument to a young child? And what's the best age to start? So it depends on the instrument, first of all, because in terms of the size of the instruments, things like a flute, a clarinet, saxophone, 
anything that's in the woodland and brass family, they don't make smaller sizes for them. Oh. So you do need to be a little bit older. So normally <laughs> the music programs, they start around fourth grade, fifth grade, depending mm-hmm. on where you are in the country. And um, so they, because their hands and arms, they grow to the size where they can fit, you know, mm-hmm. for the different keys. But when you get to things like guitar and piano and violin, viola, cello, all of those things, the nice thing about the strings is that they make smaller sizes. Mm-hmm. A violin, they can make a quarter size, which is the cutest little thing. Oh, like, yeah. Violin. Uh-huh. So they, and they measure your arm length. And as you grow, you can grow into the Ooh. instrument. Mm -hmm. Um, piano, same concept is that you're just working at the center of the piano. You don't have to worry about if you can reach the pedals or not, because you don't need them in the beginning, Mm -hmm. learning your piano technique. And then for guitar, they do make child size guitars. So yes, which is what I got her. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so you can start earlier. Um, in terms of the age, it's really the strength of the child and how well they can press down the strength. Mm-hmm. Some kids have that grip strength at an early age. Some mm-hmm. they need to wait until it develops. So that's that's the one where you have to kind of figure out: do they have the strength, you know, to push down for the strength? So, and like that, in this instance where you started something and then they mm-hmm. didn't want to do it, would you just give up, or would you try to reintroduce it a year later or something? Well, the the difference is is that um, you started out correctly by doing the one on one, and she mm-hmm. lost interest when you went into the group. And the mm-hmm. reason being is that you always have to move at the slowest pace. Ah, uh, whoever is well, I love it. You can't keep going ahead because then you're going to leave so many kids behind. Right, right. Kind of have to stay with the with the people that are falling behind and help them understand and try to get them up Mm -hmm. to snuff. But then what happens is anybody who's a little bit more ahead and a little bit more energetic and wants to move forward, they're going to be halted. They're going to get bored, right? And they'll get bored easily. Um, So the one-on-one is really a tailor-made lesson for that person. Mm -hmm. So whatever, you know, pace that they're working at, you're able to do that and you're able to follow with them. You're able to help them, to guide them. And the focus is just on them. So that it does make a big difference. I think that's a good that's a good bit of advice. Um, I think that does make sense. Mm -hmm. So you've written a parenting book and a children's book, which is really a memoir about your journey with music. When will they be available? I know that they're just about ready. So maybe this summer sometime. Yeah, I'm hoping early summer, like late spring, early summer. Um. You know, I had, uh, you know, it's been a blessing and a curse. I wrote all of this during the pandemic when basically the music world shut down for so long and I had mm-hmm. to find something to occupy my time because we, I couldn't get into a, a room or a concert hall. Like we were, couldn't perform. It was, you know, a lot of uh, restraints. And so all this create, creativity had to go somewhere. So mm-hmm. I wrote books and, um, but I have so many projects now that slowed down the final process but now i'm hoping you know with your help of course toby yes uh, yes we're I, working on it yeah yeah, yeah. so i have them out there yes i'm hoping so and i actually um i was uh i have the cover of my one book that i have which is oh, the yeah. words of wisdom uh-huh. so the one cover and then um you're working actually on my maricela and music yes cover. so which is uh i'm so i'm excited i'm hoping you know to have that out within the next couple of months. Good, good. Well, we're looking forward to reading it. I know. Well, I've read parts of it, so I already yeah. know, but everybody <laughs> else is going to love to read it. Thank what's, you. What's the hardest decision you've ever had to make? And it was actually what college I wanted to attend. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a tough, really tough decision because um, I applied to five different uh, colleges. Two of them were conservatories. No, actually, Three of them were uh, one was a high, you know, high rated university, another university that was in state. And I chose to go to William Patterson. Um, and it was William Patterson College at the time. One, because the tuition was so much more affordable. Mm-hmm. I would go in state. Um, but I did my research and it turned out that um, many of my professors had performed with the New York Philharmonic, the Metropolitan Opera. You know, all the local organizations Mm -hmm. right outside of New York City. I had my trombone teacher was in the Saturday Night Live band. Oh, wow. (laughs) And for a while, he was trying to convert me to become a trombone major because he loved how I played. 
Wow. So, I mean, you know, so you had these greats that were walking the halls mm-hmm. and I thought, oh my God, I'm getting this fantastic education at bargain basement prices. And it, I, I, at the time I thought I was making a big sacrifice by not going to Boston Conservatory or Hart School of oh Music because those are the ones I had, you know, the conservatories that I got accepted to. But I came to found that I got the best education going to William Patterson. And I still stand by it today because it's made me who I am. I think that's beautiful. And you got your master's degree, right? In music? Yeah, I went. No, actually, I did it in uh, Master of Arts because I Uh, wasn't sure what track I wanted to do, you know, for music ed. mm -hmm. And I was thinking of maybe becoming a a department supervisor of music. But then Mm -hmm. I totally changed. And (laughs) now I have my music studio. Right. And in your master's degree, you had to you had to learn to play every instrument, correct? Uh, in my undergrad, I did. Yeah. Undergrad. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I, had I just like every amazing. single instrument had to learn it mm-hmm. all. <laughs> and flute was still your favorite. Still my favorite. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Always. That's pretty it's cool. always my thing. It's always my go to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, what's one question you wish I'd ask? Is there something else you'd like to add that we didn't cover? No, I, you know what? I actually think uh, you asked everything because you asked me, <laughs> you know what? A lot of people don't ask me is ha- what music means to me, but you did. And, mm-hmm. you know, and what my connection is with it and, and how I go about my days. So you got it. You hit the nail on the head. <laughs> good, good. I love that. Yeah. And uh, in this podcast, we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to leave Lisa on the screen and she's actually going to play the flute part of my theme song in the background while I wrap up the podcast. So we'll see how this works. It's nothing (laughs) like trying something new for the first time. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Okay. All right. Are you ready, Lisa? I am. Thanks. Okay. All right. Remember, none of us is our worst mistake. We all have so much more to offer the world. And those so-called mistakes are blessed opportunities to learn and grow. Next week, we'll continue to bring you inspiring stories by people who've identified a need for change and are working to make a difference in the world. Subscribe to our Patreon channel, Fierce Conversations, for special access and behind-the-scenes info. Go to patreon.com slash fierce conversations or click on the link in the show notes. 10% 10% of the Patreon proceeds is used to provide books to women in prison. The show notes also provide a link to purchase my book, Living with Conviction, and a link to Lisa's websites as well. In my memoir, Living with Conviction, I recount a conversation I had in prison where my friend Lisa told me, in here, we can talk about all the hard things. In fact, I think we must, and so we shall. This is Fierce Conversations with Toby. Until next time.